Hello, and thanks for stopping by. Today, I'm on the outskirts of Bletchley, which is approximately 50 miles north of London, and famous as being home to Bletchley Park, the once top secret complex that was responsible for vital code breaking during the Second World War. Bletchley is now classed as an area of the UK's largest new town, Milton Keynes, as are a number of other old settlements, such as Fenny Stratford, Stony Stratford, and Simpson. This means that although Milton Keynes is a relatively modern development devised in the 1960s, there is still plenty of history to discover within the area. This is Watling Street for example, which has been incorporated into Milton Keynes' main road network, the layout of which is infamous for being peppered with countless roundabouts, although to be fair this dizzying system does help keep the traffic flowing. The path of Watling Street, which stretches between southeastern England and northern Wales, originated centuries ago, firstly as a track used by the ancient Britons, then as a paved highway developed by the Romans. In Milton Keynes, the main high speed roads are numbered and given the prefix V for vertical, or H for horizontal, which is intended to aid orientation. The section of Watling Street that runs through MK is classed as V4, and here, between H8, Standing Way, and V7, Saxon Street, you'll find this railway bridge, which carries the West Coast Main Line. Traffic and problems on the tracks aside, the trains above and the cars below are usually travelling at very high speeds through here, meaning this structure is a kind of blink and you'll miss it sort of thing. And that's a real shame, because this old bridge has a rather interesting story to tell. You see, it is in fact an abandoned railway terminal. The station was built by the London and Birmingham Railway Company, who began constructing a line linking the two cities in 1833. This was to be Britain's first intercity route connected to London, and by early 1838 the project was nearing completion. However, progress was being hampered by the troublesome construction of the 1.4 mile long Kilsby Tunnel in Northamptonshire, the site of which was being plagued by quicksand and flooding. This major obstacle left a gap in the middle of the route, and although the company were already running trains between Euston and Tring, they were eager to begin earning cash from those passengers wishing to travel the further distance between London and Birmingham. It was suggested therefore, by the project's chief engineer Robert Stevenson, that this station be set up as a temporary solution. Named Denby Hall, the origin of which we'll get to later, this station became the northern terminal for trains running out of London Euston, the length of the line being 48 miles. Upon arrival at Denby Hall, passengers would be met by an assembly of awaiting stagecoaches and omnibuses, which were on hand to ferry them 37 miles along Watling Street to Rugby Station. Once at Rugby, travellers could rejoin the railway and proceed to Birmingham's Grand Curzon Street terminus. The fleet of horse-drawn vehicles worked in both directions, making it what I guess was the world's very first rail replacement service. The go-between station opened on the 9th of April 1838 and attracted considerable attention. Here's a newspaper report describing the first day of service. The train reached Denby Hall at 25 minutes past 10. The day was uncommonly fine and along the line, particularly the newly opened portion, the crowds were immense, every village in the hamlet pouring out its inhabitants, who greeted the novel and extraordinary visitor as it passed along with loud and repeated cheering. At Denby Hall, the whole population of the surrounding districts appeared to have congregated, and in default of better accommodation, there being no regular inn or hotel in the neighbourhood, the itinerant vendors of sandwiches, rolls, pies and other dainties reaped an abundant harvest. A large tent was erected close to the station in the event of unfavourable weather, and here the passengers for Birmingham were transferred to coaches and other vehicles which had been provided for that purpose. On Mondays to Saturdays, seven trains ran in each direction between Euston and Denby Hall, with a reduced service on Sundays. The fare for the entire journey, including coach travel on the Watling Street leg, was 39 shillings for first class and 20 shillings for second class. 
second class passengers had to travel on the road in open carriages, which, apart from the odd shower, was probably not much of a problem considering the coach replacement was only required through the spring and summer of 1838. The journey time between London and Birmingham was given as eight and a half hours, four and a quarter hours of which were spent on the road. For a short time, therefore, Denby Hall Station became one of England's most important travel hubs, with special coaches from other towns and cities all converging on the station to provide a connection with trains to London. This advertisement, for example, which appeared in the press on the 20th of April 1838, promotes an express stagecoach dubbed the Railway, which ran a service to Denby Hall Station from Lincoln. Other stagecoaches included the Commercial, which ran from Nottingham, the Banbury and Buckingham, which of course ran from those two towns, the Rocket from Lichfield, the Boston from Spalding, the Times from Derby, and the Brilliant, which provided a link from Sheffield. Mail services from Ireland, Scotland, Liverpool and Manchester also took advantage by having the London-bound post transferred via Denby Hall. According to a description of the railway written in 1839, Denby Hall Terminal was a rather chaotic place. Quote, such a sense of bustle and confusion has seldom been witnessed as on the arrival of a train. Tickets had to be shown, which were given in London on booking, these were a passport to the coaches. It frequently happened, however, that parties had, during the journey, lost their tickets, so that the fare had to be paid again, or they were left behind. Then the luggage was another source of anxiety, and lastly, it frequently happened that extra passengers were stowed into a coach or omnibus, more having been booked than could be accommodated. Bad as this all appears to have been, the account continues, the public soon felt the value of shortening the time of a journey from London to Birmingham, and they did not seem to mind the inconvenience. It was quite amusing to hear the complaints about the slowness of the coaches on the road, which indeed travelled about 11 miles per hour, and the perpetual contrasts made between the speed and comfort of the old and present way of travelling, which this mingled mode of conveyance most opportunely offered. Interestingly, Denby Hall was in operation at the time of Queen Victoria's coronation, which took place on the 28th of June 1838. This event put huge pressure on the terminal as people scrambled to get to London to witness the historic ceremony. All trains and coaches were fully booked for several days, leading some cheeky touts to ask between 10 and 20 pounds for tickets, which is approximately between one and 2,000 pounds in today's money. So, where did the station get its name? Well, Denby Hall Station was in fact named after a nearby pub, not a grand manor house as you might expect. The story goes that the tavern, which had opened at the turn of the 18th century, adopted its name when Lord Denby was forced to spend the night there after his coach was involved in an accident on Watling Street. So impressed was Lord Denby with the landlord's hospitality, it's said he later made a point of popping in whenever he happened to be passing by. Prior to Lord Denby's patronage, the pub was known as the Pig and Whistle which I think would have made a wonderful name for a railway terminus. Despite its grand connection, the Denby Hall pub was reputed to be a pretty rough establishment. In its earliest days, it was said to be a favourite haunt of highwaymen, which is a believable claim considering how remote it would have been back then. Later, when the London to Birmingham railway was being built, the pub became popular with the hard-working and even harder-drinking navvies who'd quenched their thirst here after a tough day spent forging the line. Fights were common amongst navvies, and in April 1837, a large punch-up erupted between two work gangs at Denby Hall, which resulted in one man receiving a broken leg. Ouch. Contemporary accounts were rather disparaging of the Denby Hall pub, which at the time the adjoining station was open, was owned by Mr Calcraft. One railway guide called it a mean-looking beer shop, whilst a newspaper report described it as being a paltry public house, rather than the august mansion of some illustrious grandee, as many would be led to assume. The much maligned pub remained on Watling Street until it was demolished in the 1950s, and the area now known as Denby Hall is defined by a collection of industrial estates. The site of the old pub is now covered in trees and undergrowth, although rather intriguingly, this large metal shutter is also located on the spot, I'm not entirely sure, but I have a feeling this subterranean space may have been connected to the Denby Hall Tavern in some way. Maybe this was part of the cellar. Or is it just a run-of-the-mill drainage tunnel? If there's any cellar or sewer experts out there, please let me know what your theories are in the comments. In keeping with underground things, a 19th century account of the construction of the London and Birmingham Railway briefly mentions that when Denby Hall Station was being built, a large pit containing human bones was discovered. 
it was assumed this was a burial site for plague victims, which would make sense considering nearby Fenny Stratford was very badly affected during the bubonic plague of 1665. So bad in fact that Watson Street was diverted away from the village. Denby Hall Station services were required for just six months and it closed in September 1838 when the Kilsby Tunnel was complete and the line was finally able to fully open. Descriptions of the station from the period note that when Denby Hall Terminal was in operation, it was adjoined by a wooden building, although well, unfortunately this is not depicted in the one or two illustrations which date from the era. It was reported that this structure was dismantled and used in the construction of Bletchley Station, which opened just south of Denby Hall shortly after the former terminal's closure. These remnants would have been lost long ago though, as Bletchley Station is now a modern building. Just under five miles up the line from Denby Hall, the small village of Wolverton, which is also now a constituent town of Milton Keynes, became a stop on the London to Birmingham line, and as it was roughly midway between the two cities, a large repair shop and locomotive works sprang up there. This industry turned Wolverton into a railway town, with homes and other facilities being built for workers, and although the locomotive works were later moved to Crewe, Wolverton continued to build and maintain railway carriages. This has famously made it the headquarters of the royal family's private train. Back at Stenby Hall, an inscription on the bridge's southeastern pillar was unveiled in August 1920, which detailed the former station's historic role. Unfortunately, this feature is tricky and rather dangerous to appreciate today due to the proximity of the 60 mile per hour road which roars just inches away. The plaque reads, Prior to September 1838, the southern part of this railway terminated at this bridge, whence passengers were conveyed by coach to Rugby, where they rejoined the railway for Birmingham. This engraving was provided by Sir Herbert Leon and Lady Leon, who were prominent landowners in the area. It was Herbert Leon who was responsible for developing the nearby Bletchley Park estate, which would be later purchased on behalf of the Secret Intelligence Service, as the clouds of World War II loomed. But that's a story for another time. Thank you so much for watching. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on the old Denby Hall Terminal. Do you think it should be considered the focal point for the world's first rail replacement service? Perhaps more importantly, would you have braved a drink in a Denby Hall Tavern? Let me know in the comments. I'm bowled over by the incredible support and kind words which this channel has been receiving lately. Thank you so much to all of you. Your encouragement is really spurring me on to make these videos and I truly appreciate every single view, like and comment. If you're new here, please do consider subscribing and clicking the bell to receive notifications of new videos, as this will ensure you don't miss out on any future content. In the meantime, please be sure to visit my website, robslondon.com, where you'll discover more London-based trivia. I have an Etsy store too, Rob's Online Designs, where you'll find an array of hand-drawn mug designs depicting tube trains, buses and taxis, as well as some examples of London architecture. Links are all in the description. For now, thanks again friends, stay well and stay tuned.